Hey, what's going on, everybody? And welcome back to the Sec Tech Podcast. Uh, episode two. We are so excited to be here. My name is Matt. I am your host and I'm here as always with my co-host Ken Williamson. Ken, how you doing? Uh, I'm doing really well, Matt. I'm, I'm really excited for our uh, show today. We have somebody here that has a lot of information for us about product ownership, about Scrum, about Agile, different methodologies. And just, it's it's really an exciting thing to talk about because it, it feels like sometimes it doesn't get talked about a lot. You yeah. know, it's kind of taken for granted, so. Yeah, no, you're you're so right about that. I'm really excited about today's episode. Uh, the guest he is talking about is uh, Sam Haynes, who we're gonna bring in here in a minute. And yeah, today is all about um, product ownership and software methodology and how to make sure that uh, not only that you have a product owner in place, that you have the right methodology in place, but that you're headed in the right direction um, with all of those things. So I'm excited, Ken, though. What is going on in your world? Well, you know, it's it's the developer life. You know, keep keep writing the code, keep, um, you know, doing the the sprint planning, which which we uh, just recently did. And, and so that it's really put me in a mind for the for the con uh, content we have today. Yeah because it, it is just something that I've worked in places that didn't do this, and I've worked in a few different methodologies, um, and it, it really is something that gets taken for granted and overlooked a lot, and um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm really excited. It, it's gonna be good. Yeah, it's like Christmas over here, so we uh, let's not take up any more time. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we are, will have our guest, Sam Haynes, with us. Hey, what's going on, Sam? How you doing, man? Doing well. Good to see you guys. Good to have you here. Yeah, man. T Sam, tell us a little bit about yourself real quick. Yeah, so Sam Haynes, uh, I'm a product owner at SecTech. Uh, been doing this for a few years now. Uh, spent time in the tech world before I transitioned into product ownership, doing some business analytics, uh, some quality assurance testing, some various things. So I've had a background in some other roles that, that relate to, but are not directly associated with the product owner role. And, and now I see myself in this role and, and yeah, that's, that's pretty much my background. 27 years old and live here in Tulsa. I'm going to put you on the spot because I did hear that, uh, you spent some time in, in QA yeah. Right. Early on. Yeah. Um, how would you rate yourself as a QA? Uh, how were you? I would say pretty good. I you would were say, good? I would say pretty you good. pretty good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Detailed oriented, which helped with, you know, the product ownership transition. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, as a quality assurance analyst, you got to be pretty detailed. Make sure you're catching everything that comes through. And, and really just, it, it kind of set the stage for working with developers in a fashion where we're, we're working towards the same objective, yeah. even though we have different responsibilities on the team. And so I think overall, it, it definitely, it exposed me to the software development world. And uh, it, it was, it set the stage for, I guess, you know, what was to come. So overall, it was a, a good learning experience. I thought I was pretty good at it. Yeah, I, I didn't feel... exactly love it, though. I didn't love it. <laughs> sure, <laughs> I will sure. say that. Yeah, I feel like even though I'm a, a, a software engineer, I don't know if you feel like this, Ken, I don't know if I'd be a good QA. I don't know. Like, I don't I, Maybe they translate, but I've always, like, admired QAs because I'm like, I don't think I'd be very good at it, you know? Yeah, I, I mean, it is a very detail-oriented position. You know, there's just so much that goes into good QA and, and just so everyone's clear, we're talking about quality assurance. And yes. so this is the testing side of software, which is intimately related with, with product ownership because ultimately as, as Sam's going to elaborate more, but, but they, they are the per person that owns the process. And so they, they are responsible for all of these aspects. And, uh, but to answer your question, I'm not sure I would be that great at it either. Yeah. I, I'm pretty detail oriented, but I'm someone that gets a little bit bored easily. Yeah. And it's something where you, you, you have to be good at going, going through very detailed stuff that's going to be very similar to what you did yesterday and what you're going to do tomorrow. 
And, um, you know, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. There are people that are really good at it and really enjoy it, but I, it's just not quite my, my personality to, to be able to do that. Yeah, no, QA, QA would not, not fit for me, but yes, we are talking about product ownership today. Yeah, but I will, I will interject real quick because what's interesting is the quality assurance analyst has such an intimate relationship with the software itself. Yeah. And I think that ends up, or at least for me translated well, because it, it, it really gets you in all of the the details and the inner workings mm. of the software. And so the QA analyst should have a really good understanding of how each page works, how changes to one page might interact with another, you know, updates to, to fields on pages and whatever it might be. So that intimate knowledge is is definitely interesting. But yeah, not, not to stay on the, the QA stuff too much, but what was interesting is I, I found that when you find bugs, right, mm -hmm. that's a good thing so that we can yeah. address them, fix them for the software, for the customer, for the users. However, it feels like as a QA analyst, when you find a bug, you're kind of pulling the team back. So it's this weird relationship with like, mm -hmm. the, my responsibility is to find issues, right? Make sure the software is working. But when I do that, you know, do people hate me or do we, are we all yeah. bought into yeah. this idea? It's like, no, right. this is a good thing. We're, we're working towards something yeah. bigger and better. So. That was something that was always interesting, you know, working in, in quality assurance. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, it's a, it, it's a heck of a role. We have some amazing uh, QA people um, that we work with. And, uh, man, I just I, I really respect what they do. And, um, you know, for you as a product owner, yeah, so you work a lot with QAs. Mm -hmm. right on that side and you work a lot with the, the developers and you work with the business right yep. that 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 uh, you're you're kind of developing for so mm -hmm. you're really a jack of all trades and that's something that's so interesting to me about product ownership so i kind of want to start right here um tell me the difference for uh, some business leader listening to this right now the difference between a product owner and a product manager yeah, so and really there's there's three things I'd say. So we've got a product owner, we've got a product manager, and then we have a traditional project manager. So in IT, project managers, and really in any business, you're, you're going to have project managers, PMs on your projects, right? But traditionally, and even still today, a lot of that has to do more so with the schedule, the budget, um, making sure that everybody is tasked with something and that they are doing it on your schedule within your budget, right? Okay. And so... You know, even in, in when we talk about Agile and Scrum and, and working on these projects or these products more specifically, you, you need somebody that is aware of the schedule and the budget, right? And, and you do want to, for the business, for your customer, whoever, stay within the bounds that have been set. However, that's different from a product manager or a product owner. So the product owner role is specific to managing the backlog, so the, the product backlog, which is a list of all features we're going to be working on, potentially, and prioritizing that backlog. And those features come from conversations with the customer, with users, uh, maybe with your internal development team and understanding, you know, what is the highest value for the product that you're, you're building, right? Um, so that, that's pretty significant difference from a traditional project manager who's going to be more concerned with, uh, like I said, the schedule and the budget and actually tasking team members with to-dos. And the product owner doesn't do that. The product gotcha. owner communicates the value that we're trying to build for the product for its users. And then it works with the development team within the overall Scrum team to make sure we all have the shared vision, the shared understanding. And then the dev team takes that and actually solves the complex problems. But they're a self-sufficient unit, and they don't need somebody tasking them with to-dos, right? So it, that's, a, that's one of the key differences that we certainly identify and that, that I've noticed even firsthand working with these customers and internally at SecTech as well. Yeah, and and then you also mentioned uh, a, a product manager. How, how does mm -hmm. that fit in to to the overall picture? Yeah, so my understanding of product manager and how we've used the term, you know, over the past several years, and, and how that role relates to all this is the manager uh, of the product is going to be more concerned with overall vision, right? Where are we going long term with this product? And so the product owner is going to be more granular, more more day to day. Obviously, should understand the vision and where the product needs to go, but really understanding what are the features upcoming and how are those going to provide value to the product and its users. And the product manager is typically going to be more on that vision side of understanding what's the bigger picture. 
Gotcha. Gotcha. Now, I want to go back because you, you said two words, and I want to make sure everybody understands them. You said agile, and mm -hmm. you said scrum. Can mm -hmm. you define those for everybody real quick? Yeah, so the agile methodology, and, and when we talk about methodologies, there's several out there. Mm -hmm. um, but, but methodology is really just a set of ideas, set of principles that you can embody and live by, operate by. But it's really just these principles and these values, right? So agile, there's an agile manifesto that this all came from, I think, 20 years ago, uh, something like that. But uh, it basically, it values collaboration um, with your not only your customer but internally over just documentation, right? It okay. it values people and pro or people in like communication over rigid process and toolings, right? We always need process and tools to help us achieve what we need to, but it, it really values the people aspect of what we're doing more so, and so it puts a strong emphasis on this whole idea of open communication and collaboration over like you know, strong documentation and rigid structure, um, which, which again, you oftentimes need some degree of, but it's really just this kind of value set, right? In the Agile Manifestos, it's very specific, it's very simple, but that's ultimately what it boils down to. Now, Scrum is a framework that basically gives us rules that we can operate by. So specific, it, it's kind of adding that structure that I mentioned to these ideals. Because these principles are great, we can all have that shared understanding, but at the end of the day, we have to structure a team around something, and we have to deliver working software. How do we actually do that? What's the implementation side? Right. Right. So Scrum, Scrum is just a framework that gives us some of that structure, some of that um, clearly defined roles, responsibilities of a team, and really gives us, an, you know, some way to actually apply these principles that we all have a shared understanding of. And so Scrum is one of the popular frameworks right now. It's it's what we use at SecTech. We use our version, our adapted version of it. Um, Kanban or Kanban is another popular one. There's some other frameworks that people use. And, and so a lot of it just comes down to, you know, make sure everybody has a shared understanding, a shared set of values, principles that we, we as a team work and live by. And then from there, the, the rules become less important, right? Pick a rule set and just follow it and see if it works for your team. Yeah, I think that that's really interesting. And um, so, you know, I've been, you know, a, a software engineer for now for about two years. And it was about a year and a half ago before I came on the sec tech team that I was interviewing, you know, from for a position. And I interviewed four different places. And all four places um, asked me if I was a, uh, familiar with the Agile and Scrum. And, uh, you know, they, they go over some of that stuff in the boot camp. Um, but each of them described to me their scrum process and they were all completely different, mm. right? And so when I got to SecTech, I didn't really know if I understood what agile scrum was because I've heard it in four unique different ways. And so can you talk a little bit about that, about, um, y you know, the, the importance of, of not only having that system, but what the actual practical implementation should be for your business, you know, or for your team? Yeah, for sure. No, that's that's interesting. And we hear that a lot. I've seen that a lot, heard it a lot, um, you know, fr from the industry, from customers, especially when we talk about organizations that might have internal development shops, but they're not inherently a tech company, but they're, they're trying to manage technology and the building of software internally. And so they're implementing a lot of these things. And I think you touched on a, an, an important point there, which is a lot of people have a different idea of what all this means. And so you'll hear in the market, you know, we do agile um, there's no doing of agile. The idea that you as an organization are agile just means that you are valuing communication and collaboration and responding to change and you're open to those changes, right? It's this idea that we're going to continuously get feedback and we're going to live by that feedback. We're not going to just set a plan and live by the plan for the sake of living by a plan, mm. right? And so a lot of people have this, I think, you know, misconstrued sense of what the agile methodology is. And again, I just stress that it's just a set of values, a set of principles that allow you to, to build that shared understanding of what do we as an organization value. And so then when it comes down to Scrum, Scrum is more specific, right? Because it has a, a structure, a set of rules. This is what a Scrum team is. This is what a Scrum team does. So it's, it's pretty specific. It's pretty well laid out. So when it comes to maybe Scrum's a little bit different across organizations, I would say that has to do more with like implementation and adaptation 
as it relates to your team and your business, right? So with SecTech, because we're consulting, we have our own version of what makes sense for us and what has maybe failed or worked well. And we've kind of changed and refined some, some versions of Scrum ourselves. Um, but yeah, going back to that, that original comment, you know, with, with hearing Agile communicated differently, um, it, it's interesting to hear that, you know, yeah. because I think people like to think being Agile is like, is the set of rules. And yeah. it's like, no, no, no. This, these are just principles to, that you guys can, you know, help you live by and, and work well together. So, so to follow up on that, um, <clears throat> you know, maybe it would be helpful to uh, kind of contrast the agile uh, methodology with with some other ones. You know, one that I have worked in and have heard of a lot is waterfall, which is mm-hmm. a pretty different way of, of going about it. Maybe could you could you talk a little bit about the differences between those two to kind of highlight what we're talking about when we're talking about doing agile methodology versus mm-hmm. some other methodology? Yeah, for sure. And, and waterfall was the the big one. I don't know how, how much of it is used anymore, but it's certainly still out there in the market. And people even that are considering themselves agile as an organization are still operating more like a waterfall shop, right? And so Waterfall is more so this whole idea of let's plan everything from the jump. Let's actually, it's, let's define everything up front. Let's value documentation and process and tools over people and, and collaboration and this response to change and response to feedback. Let's define everything up front and then we'll work it all the way down until it's completed. Agile is a lot different. Agile is thinking, um, you know, being agile again is response to change. And so it's, it's this value set of saying, okay, we're going to get feedback. Let's show working software often so that we can get continuous feedback and respond to that feedback, respond to that change. So it's just a little bit of a, of a mind shift there, especially organizationally, where it's like in software, especially with today, changing technologies, tech stacks, even user wants and needs, it, it's very difficult to effectively plan everything up front and then six 12, 24 months later, deliver something and expect it to be not only perfect, not only tested and working out the jump, but actually, you know, satisfy the wants of the users. I mean, it's been, you know, six, 12 months, whatever. Things have changed. Their wants have changed. And again, the technologies maybe even themselves have changed. So again, it's just that that mind shift of saying, let's value response to change, getting things in front of people more often and just responding to that. Yeah, I think that that's so good. So so to kind of put that in um, a little bit of a scenario here, like, so I'm a business uh, leader, and we are developing new software within the company. If I'm going with the waterfall method, then we're planning all this out, and it's like, cool, see you in 12 months with the product, mm-hmm. right? Yep. Whereas if we're agile, you're in front of me like every two weeks, like right. showing me literally in real time what changes right. your developers have come up with, Right. 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 Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, and again, that's now we're getting into more like, uh, how do you actually engage with them? What are the rules to do that? And again, that gets more into the framework, but, but you're exactly right. We're being agile says, no, 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 you're, you're not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. We're going to continue this collaboration and communication, both on the software development side, but more importantly, between you and the business stakeholders. So yeah, I'm not going to see you in 12 weeks, 12 weeks. I'm going to see you next week. And we're going to talk about these features as we're building them. And you're going to give feedback. And the reality is, and we've seen it at SecTech, anybody in software I'm sure has seen this, where the wants and needs change often. And they change right away. You know, <laughs> So this idea that the business, and you know, I, I went to college for a finance degree. I'm, I'm pretty business-minded, business-oriented. And even I would say, uh, you know, I, I, I wouldn't, and I see in businesses, they don't know ultimately what they want, certainly not right away, right? And especially as it relates to software, because you've got to start seeing and using software to understand what frustrations you might have or new ideas that would actually automate some of your processes. And so all of that has to be done by visually seeing and experiencing the software. Yeah, I I completely agree. It's, it's something where 
people, and this isn't just software. This, this mm -hmm. is oftentimes just in, in life. You, you don't know what you want or you don't know what you need until you've tried a few things. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like uh, in Waterfall, you're trying to figure out everything you want or need for this giant problem up front mm -hmm. and then execute, whereas in, in – uh, an agile methodology and, and specifically in the scrum framework, you're really trying to break it down into what's next. Mm -hmm. What, what, what is the next piece that's going to add value? But, you know, there are a lot of people that value that planning up front and, and from a business perspective, you know, being able to plan resources and understand what you're going to need, um, is, is valuable too, e even if it may turn out that, that, you know, you didn't get the best result. H how do you communicate to the business that this is the better way to go forward? Uh, yeah. even though, you know, instead of them just kind of fire and forget, here's the plan. See you in 12 months. Give me what I want to, okay, we need to meet every, you know, three weeks, four, two weeks, whatever, whatever it may be in, mm -hmm. in the framework you're using and, and, and reevaluate. Uh, how, how do you, how do you communicate that? How do you show them the value to, to that increased engagement? Yeah. Great question. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's, that's, it's an interesting problem to solve. And, and what's interesting is it goes back to like, you know, the Agile Manifesto, it's not to say that some things aren't valuable, right? Documentation and having a tool set that works for the team is valuable, maybe not as valuable as, as the collaboration, the in-person communication that, that we value maybe a little bit more. So to that point, you know, the planning phase, the understanding of what we plan to build is still important right? So being agile doesn't mean, and I think a lot of shops end up falling into this trap, it doesn't mean we don't plan, right? We're going to plan. We just need to all have a shared understanding that things will change. And we can prove that time and time again. So that's to address that. As far as business buy-in, I think for me, the, the reality and, and how I communicate it to the business stakeholders is one, this software is for you and your department or your employees or maybe even you as a user, this is important to you in your organization. Also, I want you as a business stakeholder invested, basically as a part of my team on the customer side, invested in the success of the development of the software that ultimately needs to be solving real people's problems, right? And so I think once you once you kind of communicate it like that, where it's like, hey, look, we, we need buy-in from you guys because this is for you. I want to be building software that actually helps you solve real business problems. Then they, they are much more willing and able to, you know, participate in, in the process because you've, you've got to get customer or stakeholder buy-in. I think that's part of it, too, is we always tell people, you know, new, new customers, we say, look, this, this will fail if we do not get all customer or, or stakeholder buy-in from the jump. Right. Because th this is at the end of the day, software is for people, Yeah, you know, and, and I think that's where a lot of things get lost, too. It's it's not so that we can build all this cool stuff that never gets used. Right. I mean, right. it's only as good as how much it's being used yeah. and what problems it actually solves, what processes it actually automates. And so all that's coming from the business because we, we have to be solving real business problems. Otherwise, it's like, what you know, what are we doing? What, build a cool robot and, and let's watch it, you know, wander around. I don't know. Yeah, I, I think that that's, that's a really good uh, point. And Ken, that was a great question because I think if I was a business owner, uh, development's not cheap. Mm -mm. It's just not, or at least good development, great right. development right. isn't cheap. Right. And so, you know, for me, like as a business leader, I'd be like, yeah, I'm all in on a waterfall method because if I'm paying all this money, I want you to show me exactly what you're doing. Whereas Agile is a little bit like we're building the plane as you go. Mm -hmm. And so trust becomes so, so important if I'm a, a business owner. Um, and, and to that, I kind of want to switch gears just a little bit. This is just... Uh, um, I, I didn't uh, even prep you for this question, so right. so uh, <laughs> I'm ready. But but I was just kind of thinking about it as we were talking because I'm kind of curious about this how how you handle this as a a senior product owner. Um, a little nugget for those product owners out there. I think what's so interesting we've all been there where we build some awesome page, mm. some awesome feature, 
and like the the data is lightning fast and it works super cool and then you show it to the business owner and all they want to talk about for an hour is like what color the button is yeah you know yeah. like these little details like how how do you keep business owners thinking about like the meta and the things that actually mm -hmm. matter going into software and not like man i just like two weeks it's like I, we still just don't like the font you know right, right. how do you keep them focused on like the things that are really going in that i guess to to an engineer i would kind of say like matters it, it matters more to me like right. how the software works but even for them like the actual functionality of the application more than like some of the minor details that i know all business owners get you know kind of stuck on you know yeah. what i mean yeah it's a that's another it's an interesting it's an interesting problem I mean, I think for, for myself as a product owner and other product owners out there, I always tell people, even our other product owners, like always ask another question. I mean, that's a that's an easy way to, for them because part of what I and I think product owners should do is you should, you should have your stake owners prove to you why something is valuable. If they can't prove to you as a product owner that something is worth spending time, money, resources on, then, it, it, you know... It, they usually, hopefully, can realize that reality, and they, they will then shift to the more valuable features or feature ads, right? And so, you know, I think that's, that's certainly a big part of it. Um, you know, for, for other product owners, yeah, I mean, I think, I think just having that relationship and building that trust with the stakeholders is, is going to be pretty, pretty important. However, I will say the more I've been in this role, the more I realize – you know, some of those what seem like minor details, yeah. insignificant details that why are we focused on that from the development side, you realize psychologically those have a lot more impact to the, the software users Absolutely. than maybe, you know, the, the full-fledged feature that has all this cool stuff that, that is more interesting and fun to build. You realize, hey, look, that, that font, for whatever reason, that really bugs our users, and they associate that with the software, and then they yep. think maybe the software is bad or it doesn't work the right way. Mm -hmm. And so users are good at making that, those comparisons, even though they're, they're maybe, from our perspective, illogical, right? But that, that impact is still there, and so it's a, it's a balance, right? You've got you've to hear that, hopefully fix those, resolve those, change those, and you have the understanding from the users interacting with them so that you can actually be proactive. So maybe you can make those changes before it actually gets in front of them. Um, but I would say, yeah, asking the questions is the big thing, right? A asking, always asking that follow-up question, getting them to understand the value that we're trying to provide them and having them prove that value to you as a product owner first. Yeah. So we've been talking a lot about product ownership as it relates to outward facing customers, or, mm -hmm. you know, if you're in a, in a big company, uh, IT department, your internal customers, mm -hmm. your stakeholders, mm -hmm. but let, let's talk a little bit about product ownership as it relates to the, to the team. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as a product owner, <clears throat> how, how do you work on communicating effectively what you got from the stakeholders, what you're yeah. understanding on a business level, and give the dev team the tools they need in order to make something that fits those business level requirements, you know, but, but without, mm -hmm. without getting overly technical, uh, you know, because, you know, some product owners may be technical, and I know you're, you're I would say maybe semi-technical, mm -hmm. yeah. and, um, you know, but, but, can, can you talk a little bit about that translation between business ideas and then requirements for feature development for for stuff, uh, bug fixes and, and, and the like? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think it starts with understanding the business, right? Whether it's a customer of yours or it's an internal business or a department, right? The business unit. It's understanding the business and the processes that actually make them run and make them successful. And then you work your way to, to something more granular, right? It's then understanding specifics of a particular process within that business or business unit. And then from there, it's understanding, okay, how does this actually impact employees, users of the software? And then you could start identifying specific workflows, right? That relate to specific features that we need to build within maybe a process or to replace a more manual process. And so it's just working your way down to understanding the business, the users, the software, and all the way down to specific units and processes within those business units. Mm -hmm. And then from there, we, you know, and this is, this is goes into scrum framework and, and some of the rules that have been set out. But then I, as a product owner, write user stories and we have a particular way of writing those, but it communicates to the dev team 
the what and the why of what we're building. And then I, as a product owner, don't have to worry about how we're actually going to solve the problem. I'm responsible for clearly and concisely communicating what the problem is and why it's important to even solve in the first place. And then from there, the dev team takes that information, clarifies what that means by interacting with the product owner, you know, on the scrum team side. But then from there, you guys take the problem and you actually go solve it, right? You, you, guys, you guys worry about the how. How do we solve this problem and implement it through software, the tech stack, the environment where you're, we're working in, whatever it might be. And so the product owner is able to work, you know, without being hopefully technical at all. You know, I mean, I think just the nature of being around and communicating with developers, you end up picking up on some things and you can kind of grow to be more technical. But really, I tell people, you don't have to be technical and you, you really shouldn't be. I mean, the product owner is responsible for understanding the what and the why. The how really shouldn't be a concern. And you should be working with dev team that you trust and that is smart enough and, and capable enough to solve those complex problems. Yeah, that's so good. And, um, you know, we'll get you out of here on, on, on this question right here, Sam. I, I'm curious for for you, you know, you're, I love what you said because I think there are a lot of people that love technology, um, love development, but maybe they're not a developer, mm -hmm. right? Right. Mm -hmm. Like that's not quite going to be their role. Um, and, but they, they, they kind of, you know, they want to, to be a part of this industry and product ownership is going to be a great place for them. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious, you know, do you, do you just start, you know, going on job sites and like, let me find a product owner job or what, like if, if somebody's listening to this right now, like I kind of want to pivot in my career or start a new career, product ownership sounds like something I want to do. How do you get started? What do you recommend? Where are the places to go? You know, um, how, yeah, how does that come about? Because software engineers kind of, not easy, but you just learn to cope, yeah, right? There's, you, there's kinda, different boot camps. And right, like right. That. Yeah, yeah. product owners are different. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it, it's an interesting question. I've been asked of, asked that same question by, you know, some of my friends, some acquaintances, some people, you know, that, that are even in the, in, the, in the industry that I work with. But, um, I mean, I would say just there's a wealth of, of information on, on YouTube and on Google like anything else. And, and so I've kind of curated from my perspective what articles and what videos align with what I believe is valuable in the role and the responsibilities that I think are under uh, that role, um, you know, what, what responsibilities fall with that. And so you kind of got to find and, and curate yourself or, you know, if you reach out to me, I can, I can give you that list of resources. But then there's different organizations as well. So Scrum Alliance is one of those that has a wealth of content that they've curated. They have different certifications that allow you to go through a formal class and program to understand what specifically we're talking about here. Uh, and, and there's starting to be more and more. I mean, I think the reality is, to your point, you know, there's a lot of people that are interested in technology but don't want to write code, you know, eight, nine, ten hours a day. And that's fine. And, and thankfully, there are roles in technology that don't require that. I mean, we talked about quality assurance analysts earlier. That's one of those. Yeah. Um, you know, you really don't have to understand how to code. Now, there, automated testing is becoming more uh, important and more, more popular. But there are ways to be involved in the industry, in the, the, the delivery of cool software that actually solves real problems without writing code. And so... You know, product owner is one of those. I think if you come from a business background, business analytics, um, if you come from the business world and, and you've interacted with these folks, that often has a good transition. But you also, you, you need to understand the importance of, you know, uh, developers and, and what it is they're doing and how we actually build uh, software in a way that solves business problems. But I would say it's a pretty open role and a pretty open field to, to you know, get your way in the door, but, uh, I don't know what that clear path is, you know? Um, it's still kind of not, not the wild west, but it's still, it, yeah. you know, it's kind of, um, something that maybe you wouldn't say new, but, um, is something that's still gaining traction and mm -hmm, doesn't mm -hmm. quite have that clear, that clear path. So yeah, yeah, I love what you're saying. We'll definitely make some resources available. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's I, I, th I mean, it's not the wild, wild west, but it's still kind of the, yeah. the wild west. Like, it's uh, it's one of those roles that organizations are still trying to figure out, you know, what it means, how they can hire the right product owners, what it, what exactly they do, how do they provide value. I mean, we go through this, and, and we went through it, I would say, for several years with our customers of, of 
even just proving to them that the product owner role was so important for their project and their software that we're building for them, right? Yeah. And just saying, hey, look, we need somebody to own the outcome, own the process, work with both customer, user stakeholders, as well as the development team, and really bring everybody onto the same page with a shared understanding, a shared objective, and actually owning what it is we're doing, right? Because it's easy to say, okay, this guy over here does this, this guy over here does this, right? But you kind of have to have somebody that's rallying the troops and saying, we're, we're all in this together, both the business stakeholders and the, the IT department, which have oftentimes, especially traditionally, been at odds, bringing them all together and say, hey, look, we're all working towards the same objective. So I think the market's definitely coming around to it, but it's still one of those roles that, although I would say now is clearly defined, um, there, there is still not a lot of understanding and definition within a lot of organizations of how to actually hire and, and use these product owners. But, I mean, the, the roles are certainly out there. I'm seeing more of them. Um, I know that associate product owners, it, uh, that's, that's I would say, probably the easiest way to get in the door. Yeah. For larger organizations, especially larger tech companies, they'll have associate product owners. So it's kind of that entry level. You'll work underneath a senior product owner who's actually, you know, managing the product backlog, is responsible for all of that, that process, the implementation of it and all that. Um so, so that's that's one way, you know, junior product owner, associate product owner is probably what, what people should look at to see how to get their foot in the door. That's so good. Uh, Ken, close the dots. Um, I th think it was a great conversation, mm -hmm. and it's, it's so good to be able to talk about some of this side of the, the development because, you know, as, as software engineers, you know, we, we can kind of take for granted, you know, and, and – you know, sometimes there's a little bit of uh, uh, frustration between between the product owner and, and the dev team, you know, and so it, it's just been really great to talk to you and, and to hear a lot about the perspective that, that you uh, bring to a team and to a business and just, it was great. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, I, I appreciate it. I, you know, I could, I could talk about this stuff for, for hours, so <laughs> well, I'll, I'll well, definitely have to come back on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We got to have you back on, man. We really appreciate your time. Thank you yep. so much. This wraps up episode two of the Sec Tech Podcast. We'll see you guys later.